This is Andy Poirot of Boxing Social in association with Betfred. I'm joined by promoter Eddie Hearn here in New York. Eddie, I apologise if I've almost just taken your, your head off with my camera light there, but did you get up to much last night for Thanksgiving? No, I had, a, I had a really nice Thanksgiving lunch, and as I said to you off camera, I had two vodka martinis, which are very big. I don't drink vodka martinis, but a friend of mine said, you've got to try the vodka martini. I went, all right then. They're like, you know, in a martini glass, but a big glass, one glass of red wine. I was, I was gone. I was gone. I got in a cab back to the hotel, 5.45 p.m. All the other boys went, come on, we're going for a few drinks and dinner. I went, no, mate, I'm done. I went to bed. Went to bed at 6 p.m., woke up at 9 p.m. All over the gaff. Here we are, ready for the weigh-in. So, no, nothing major, but definitely getting old, Andrew. And that my days of partying are long gone. Yourself? I joined up with Lever and Scott, uh, Scott's birthday celebration, so... Well, I was out with Scott. And I binned it off to go to bed, and where did you where did you lot end up? So we just went to a few bars closer to the hotel. Um, I got back at a reasonable time, they, they stayed out, and here we are indeed. Yeah, I've not the seen them, which is a bit well, worrying. Scott's but... just turned up, so nice, um, yeah. Nice, you can... nice of Scott just to turn up half an hour before the weigh when he's got to run the social media and digital side. Well done, Scott. Uh, you've grasped him up there, Andy. Well done. I apologise, Scott. Um, I owe you a drink later. But uh, back to the business, obviously, we're here. I don't know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea to do this interview beforehand because we just don't know what's going to happen between the pair of them uh, on the scales. Are you expecting more of what we've seen, maybe even just more so of it, more of it rather, uh, today with regards to their animosity that we've seen throughout this week? I hope so, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, I think both guys making weight, always difficult for people making weight. Uh, I think Tiafimo Lopez will find it difficult to make 135. Um, George is here, looks good, but again, it's a struggle for everyone. And you know, if there's bad blood before the weigh-in, when you've got two guys that are down to, you know, the, the bone in terms of their weight, they're going to be a little bit more aggravated. So um, I expect it to be nice and fiery, and it's good because we've got a big fight ahead on Saturday. So a little bit more drama. I'll have to get in the middle and make sure no one gets chinned. Hopefully not me and hopefully they make weight and we, we uh, have a fantastic fight tomorrow evening. I saw George tweet that he um, that TFEMO never part partook in the round table. Can you just tell me as to why that was? We had a sort of gloves are off style, I say show, but filming planned after the press conference. A um, little bit, I wouldn't say my fault, but obviously we delayed the press conference because I was a little bit late. Uh, it went on a little bit and we asked Tiafimo to do it and he said he'd, he'd like to pass on that because he wants to go back Thanksgiving tomorrow, see his son, etc. So I saw George's comments and uh, that was a nice little way to say, I'm here, where are you? And, uh, you know, mate, read into that what you will. But uh, for Tio, I think that was just, don't wanna, I don't want to be around that guy. I don't want to be engaged in arguments with him and I want to I leave, I want to get out of here. So aggravated... Maybe, um, yeah, but it was a, I think psychologically it was a good win for George. And I think in these kind of fights, you have to find that belief. You know, if you're George Cambosis, you can believe in yourself and you can believe in your ability, but you have to take little bits of, of positivity and confidence during the week. One might be the stare down. You know, I heard him say, you walked away again, you know. And to a fighter, whether that's relevant or not, it's important in the mindset. Again, with a sit-down interview, you didn't do that. You didn't want to look in my eye and talk to me, did you? Now, whether that's relevant or not, it's another win in Cambosis' head, and you need that kind of confidence going into this fight. And, and you know, he, he believes he can win. He's coming to win. And this is, this is going to be an interesting fight. If this fight starts going past four, five, six rounds, it's going to get very, very interesting. Um, but it's going to be also very dangerous for Cambosis early in this fight. Tifimo had some strapping on his shoulder and across his arm at the workout and he, he admitted yesterday he'd been carrying a bit of a knock. Do you know what that is? No, I mean, look, he's not our fighter, but I saw he's, it's not unusual for a fighter to have that tape on them if they're carrying a little bit of injury. And to be honest, Andy, like, I don't really know many fighters who don't have an injury or a niggle during camp. It's a very, very um, robust environment. It's a very, very... Uh, high maintenance environment that these guys are in sparring he's been training for what 10 months for this fight so but I've seen him on the pads I've seen him sparring he's firing on all cylinders so again another thing that Cambosis might look at the fact that you have it openly strapped is generally a sign that it's not a major problem you don't want to give anything away maybe he couldn't give couldn't care less if he gives anything away but again if you're Cambosis you're you know the shoulder you know there is there's a, there's a niggle
So a little bit more positivity. Tifimo is a heavy favourite heading into a Saturday night. So with that in mind, you've got Devin fighting next week. You've got Javante Davis fighting the day after. Tifimo has spoken openly, wants to face Josh Taylor as well. With all these kinds of names being in the mix and potentially facing off next year, if not moving further into 2022 or 2023 rather. How important is it that he looks good on Saturday night if he is to be successful? It's always important to look good. You know, I think that's something that fighters... I say have to recognise because they, they're not idiots. They know they have to look good. But looking good is the key to increasing your value. You know, looking good is the key to making people want to tune in and watch you. Looking good is the key to driving sales at the box office for tickets. You know, that is every, looking good is everything. Um, winning is also everything. But if you can win and look good, then you're a, a valuable commodity. And I don't think Tiafimo Lopez will look bad in a fight because I think he's very explosive, I think he's very dangerous and he wants to look good, he recognises the value of looking good and looking good will increase his value in the next fight and so forth. So um, you know, when you look at those fights, again we've already had, we already have a handshake between all the fighters and the parents that Haney against Lopez both winning their fights now is the fight we will make next. Now I don't expect Tiafimo to go back on his word. But I do think he might look to move up in weight because I think he might struggle to keep making 135. Um, obviously, the Josh Taylor fight's there as well. I don't think, I don't necessarily think that's a fight that's going to interest Josh Taylor that much, like from a legacy point of view. He's like he said, he's got no interest. No, but he's kind of giving Tiafimo the chance to become undisputed at 140 after he went through such an arduous process to get it, and now he's giving this other guy one shot to get it. You know, so I think probably in Josh Taylor's head, he's thinking, I don't want to give him a shot. I'd rather fight Crawford or I'd rather fight someone else. But, you know, Josh has to maximise his moment now as undisputed champion and make his money and, and be in those those legacy fights. So we'll see. I was going to touch on the Devin Haney situation. TV most I think it was with Umar the other day saying that he's agreed to face him or something along those lines. Is that just a matter of when they had the you know, back and forth ringside after the Mike Garcia no, was, fight? That you going so off? We have, or? we have to negotiate a deal, but we've all agreed that that fight is next. It doesn't mean it happens or we got a contract, but it's, it's quite awkward and a bit embarrassing for anyone to back out of that fight. And I don't think I know Devin Haney won't price, price himself out of that fight. The money's there for Tiafimo to do that fight. So we'll have to see. Look, he's got to get through Cambosas. Devin's got a really tough fight next week against Jojo Diaz. And then we'll look at it all. Uh, I didn't get a chance to touch on the heavyweight scene with you properly the other day. You kindly stepped aside so I could interview T. Fimo. So I just wanted you to touch on that a bit more. Um, yeah, just a bit more kind of knowledge as to where things stand with White Fury first and foremost, or Fury White. Um, just obviously the, the legal process and the arbitration process ongoing. Um, you know, Dillian White has been waiting a long, long time. And this process, this legal process, was in place so that he gets what he deserves. It wasn't happening naturally, so he had to go through this process to get um, what he feels is right. We expect that to, to play out in the very near future. And we expect the mandatory to be called for Tyson Fury being Dillian White. And we also expect a fair split on that fight. You know, the minimum split, I believe, is 70-30 for the mandatory challenger. And, you know... They're talking about 80-20. I mean, it can go up to 55-45. And when you look at Dillian White's commercial value, the fact that he's top, what, seven pay-per-view events, you know, he's a big draw at the, at the gate as well. We feel that that's where that, that split should be, but that will be ruled independently. But um, at least when that is ruled, there's no, you know, oh, he could do that, he could do that. And that, that's why he's gone down that process. What do you see? What do you actually deem to be a fair split, Eddie? Because I think you said to me the other day, 55, 45. Do you that's, think that's, that's the, fair? Or? Yeah, that's the high interim split. I mean, you have to go through the process of saying, you know, Dillian White's been waiting a long, long time, and you should be compensated for waiting a long, long time. He's also headlined seven pay-per-view events. He sold out the O2 on numerous occasions. He's the interim world champion. You know, so he brings a huge amount of value in that fight. But Tyson Fury is also right now on paper the number one heavyweight in the world, and and he's a star as well. So it's, we've got to be sensible. 80-20 is ridiculous. But I feel like it should be more towards the maximum end for the interim champion because of the situation. It's not like this guy's just rocked up, someone's made him mandatory and he gets his shot. This guy's been waiting for years and years to get his shot as, as the mandatory. And that has to be taken into consideration. So does the fact that he's interim champion. We've spoken about you know potential Tyson AJ fight if AJ would step aside at all for Tyson to face Usyk rather. Um, saw Tyson's comments that he feels that 
AJ should step aside so Van Tyson can face Usyk because if Usyk beats AJ again, that fight's done for him. There's no point in him facing AJ. Do you see where he's coming from? Yeah, well, I, I see where he's coming from in terms of him wanting to fight Usyk because you know he wants to be that undisputed champion and that fight would give it to him. But obviously we have a contract in place to fight Usyk. That's what we intend to do. Um, it's a very dangerous fight. I, I can see, listen Andy, when, when Joshua lost to Andy Ruiz here, Everyone said to me, you can't put him back in with Andy Ruiz. He's just been knocked out. He needs to recover. He needs to rebuild. He went straight into the rematch and won every round. So he wants to regain his world championship belts. So that's the mindset of Anthony Joshua right now. And um, I understand uh, Tyson's comments. Um, but, you know, we have a contract for that fight. Dillian White looks like he's going to be ordered as the mandatory. And I expect those, those to play out that way. Are you expecting similar dates for those fights? similar kind of periods I mean we'll you know we'll, we'll all be sensible together and make sure that we don't do that around the same day it wouldn't be good for either fight so March April you know one first one second I saw Fury talking about a February fight I know he's been unwell um, I don't see you know we'd, we're December next week I don't see a February fight really playing out I think March and April or something around that period where do you think is most likely for AJ Usyk to take place Wembley probably I spoke to Alex Krasik this morning I mean look you know, the, the plan would be to go out and, and raise the biggest site fee possible for a fight like that. But at the same time, we'd love to do it in the UK again. And Wembley, Spurs, wherever, I think, I think he's probably the front runner. Can a Fury AJ fight still happen if AJ was to lose? The fight, to the fight will always be there, but it, it's there in different values. You know, if AJ beats Usyk, then the, the Fury fight becomes massive. You know, Fury could lose to Dillian White. I mean, anything could happen, as we've seen. So, but the, that, those fights will always be there. And AJ always wants to be in those big fights and he wants to fight the best. And, you know, Fury is a fight that he loves. Now, thankfully, Eddie, John Fury wasn't sending for you the other day like he has previously, but I'm sure you saw his comments mm. towards Jake Paul. I just want to get your thoughts on what, what he had to say to, to Jake Paul. Uh, I mean, I saw it. It was, it, was, it was really bad, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it was the worst press conference I've ever seen. And I'm not slating the show because the fight is what it is. But... You know, I mean, you could even see. I've, I've been there at a much, on a much smaller scale in terms of cringe and disgustingness, if you like, when I was doing KSI against Logan Paul. And when I saw Frank Warren's face on the on the screen, he was he was dying with embarrassment, and it was the language was terrible, the things that were being said were terrible, and we have to understand that this audience is a younger audience. You know, and it's, it's distasteful. I don't mind, when we're talking about a fight, like a real fight between these guys, when they come together and he's saying this and that, I, but you, you're, I don't know, I don't, it just sounds like I'm being a hater, but it, it's not good. It's not a good look for boxing and it's not a good look for the reputation of the sport. I'm not even talking about the fight, because I don't mind the fight. It's just two novices, like having a fight, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's that distasteful that kids are watching it. And we're supposed to be, we're supposed to have role models in sport. And I feel that role models is something that kids are really lacking in life in general, especially across sport. And, um, but again, I don't want to just sound like, oh, he's just been, because he's not promoting the show. It's got nothing to do with that. It's just, it, it was, and I like hype. You know, I like anything that's going to create noise, but it's just, it's, it's a bad look, bad look. And I think everyone involved at a sensible level was extremely embarrassed by the whole thing. Final couple of things from me, Eddie. We spoke about the middleweight and the super middleweight scene the other day, but one thing I forgot to ask you and people have picked up on is, you know, you've had a number of middleweights and super middleweights signed to you during the period working with Demetrius Andrade and the question as to why he hasn't faced one of those, a like Golovkin, a Mungria, et cetera, the, the list goes on. He's not yeah. bought, obviously, fights on the zone with yeah, Golden Boy, et cetera. You you've, had, you've had a number of fights. I apologise on that. I have, and, uh, and Gennady Golovkin, you know, we work with on a co-promotional front twice, I think, you know, um, He's the only fighter that we've represented and not, you know, we were co-promoting his show, helping him with the undercard and the running of the show. So I haven't had the opportunity for any of those names, Munguia, Charlo, Canelo at the time, to, to put those fighters together. And it still takes two to tango. Like, just because you represent someone, it doesn't mean you can make a fight. But, um, you know, I, I think it was Leonard Ellerby, my mate, uh, who came out and said, you know, he's had all these chances to... Put him in with these guys, not really. I mean, when they talk about Danny Jacobs, I mean, there could be an argument, but the problem is with there is they're, they're friends and they never really wanted to fight each other. But 
and it wasn't a fight that worked out at the time. But you know, I still think that you guys, the fans, the broadcasters, shouldn't be giving Charlo the pass to not fight Demetrius Andre. Stop saying about well they've had they should be looking to fight those guys. No, why can't we look to fight you? Why do you want to make excuses about who we should be fighting when you're a world champion and we want to unify? Do you know what I mean? So the question needs to be from fans and media to Charlo, why won't you fight Demetrius Andre? Just tell us why. Why not? Uh, oh, he's not a big name. Shut up. Rubbish. Uh, he's not exciting. Really? Watch his last fight against Jason Quigley. Uh, there's no money in the fight. Lies. Uh, well, it, there, there's no reason not to fight him. You want to unify, you want to be a great fighter, which he is. Two undefeated American middleweight world champions. You know, talk about great eras of boxing. You, know, you get to a stage where I'm not saying that Charlo and, and Andre de Hagler and Hearns but the reasons those eras were great is because everyone went, I believe I can beat him. I will fight him because I want to unify and I want to fight the face of champions. So you guys, you and everybody else, fans particularly, social media, you need to put pressure on and ask the question why. And that really helped me out. So please do it. Hopefully I'll see him soon. Um, final, well, final couple rather. Your show tonight, excited, looking forward yeah, to it? The beginning of his partnership. Yeah, yeah, Porto Vallarta, Eddie Reynoso's down there. I think Canelo's going as well. Um, WBA World Featherweight Championship on the line. Um, some good fights on the card as well. Um, Fierro, our latest signing, really excited about him. Valenzuela, Gomez Duran, um, big card and just part of our development globally. It's a big weekend globally for, for Matrim and Zone, of course, with Mexico, but also with Australia. You know, Australia is such an important market for us in 2022, and this fight um, is going to do huge numbers with Cambosis. Um, still the introductory price in Australia, I think it's three bucks to watch this fight. I think they just had Jeff Horn on at 80 bucks or something like that recently. Sorry, not Jeff Horn, Tim Zhu. And uh, this is a big, big fight for Australia, and we're signing a lot of Australian talent, and we're looking forward to being there next year. Did you tune in to watch the Wasserman Boxing Show last night on streamed live on Boxing Show? No, I saw, but I, st I didn't watch it, but I saw the Harvey Horn, uh, um, yeah, and that was a big, big surprise. So congratulations for Boxing Social um, for supporting and airing that show. Congratulations. Final one, Eddie. Why should everyone tune in to watch his fight tomorrow night? They should tune in. Well, not just that. They should tune in first for Mexico tonight. But tomorrow yeah. night, you should tune in because you're seeing one of the great young stars of the sport, Teofimo Lopez, in a really high-voltage fight. You know, two guys that are coming to win, two guys that don't like each other. We're at Madison Square Garden. You know, you've got the belts on the line, everything on the line. Of, and Teofimo is the guy who dethroned Lomachenko. You know, you have to put him up there as a pound-for-pound -pound star right now. This is going to be an all-action firefight, so tune in for the undercard. Really good fight in the super featherweight division as well. Uh, IBF world title on the line for Fuzili against Agawa. The winner of that is going to fight Zelfa Barrett and Eliminator, Joe Caldina. Uh, Zile Zhang in a, in a good fight as well. Ray Ford, look out for him. Great star. Ramla Ali coming on the stream uh, and some good prospects as well. So big night of boxing and a, and a massive month of boxing going up. And I, I keep saying to you, if you haven't subscribed to the zone, subscribe now because you are going to get all the action over the next four weeks in that monthly period. Do you know what I mean? You're going to get, obviously, Mexico tonight. You're going to get Tiafimo against George Cambosis. You're going to get Haney Diaz next week. Bill Bao as well next week with Flatley fighting uh, Leharaja and Campbell Hatton on that card as well. Then you're going to get Conor Ben, Chris Algieri, Katie Taylor against Sherry. But then you're going to get Chisora Parker. Plus, we're about to announce Madrimov against Soro in Uzbekistan. Final eliminate. It's an absolute firefight. So the value on the zone is unprecedented. I believe if you're watching this, you already subscribe. But if you don't, subscribe now. Eddie, and it's always been a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.